Introductions are oftentimes more for the one making the introduction rather than receiving it. And that's clearly uh, the case today. I was warned earlier today about hagiography, no, but I simply have got to speak about our special guest tonight. The Reverend Dr. Ken Bailey is a renowned and respected, and this is a term that was just coined about an hour and a half ago in our library, a respected cultural archeologist. He minds the culture of stories. He says that the deeper meaning of a story can only be unlocked by uncovering the culture behind it. I think it's just one of his great gifts. His books have become classics in their field, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes and Paul Through Middle Eastern Eyes, and his most recent book, The Good Shepherd, which is now a wonderful video series available through the Trinity Online Bookstore. If you haven't seen the video series that goes with the book, The Good Shepherd, please look at it. It's, it's a wonderful series. And, and just on a personal note, you, know, you, you really changed my life, fundamentally. Mm -hmm. Because when I first heard uh, Dr. Bailey uh, teach about at least 20, 22 20, years 20 ago, years at least, ago. Yeah. it was one of those iconic moments, those, those epiphanies. It just, it, it, it changed fundamentally the way I, I look at scripture. And it's just been so important to me. It's so important for our age. Those of us who are educators understand this more and more and more. And so that's why I'm, I'm delighted that, that Dr. Bailey can be with us tonight. And the topic of his lecture is, is so timely. And so I just want you to join me in welcoming a, 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 just a great man of the church and of the faith, Reverend Dr. Ken Bailey. Thank you, Mark. Uh, my relationship to Trinity is what we would call in Arabic semnat asil, honey, butter and honey mixed together. So I have for now 20 years been privileged to be, have, have opportunity for teaching of short courses and for the delivering of an occasional lecture. And it has been one of the rich teaching experiences and also uh, chances for fellowship together in the name of Christ that I have known. And I'm deeply grateful for, to you, Mark, and to those other responsible for the selection which made it possible for me to be here with you. Our topic is the Bible, colon, quaint relic or bright light, a Middle Eastern view. In the West in our day, many seem, seem, see the scripture as a quaint relic. If such is the case, then the Bible can quietly be set aside by Christians or even shredded as they look for other foundations on which to build theology and ethics. But across the century, in the great tradition, scripture has always been seen as a bright light. For us, the critical focus is on the person, message, and ministry of Jesus, who is again and again called our Lord Jesus Christ. This revered biblical phrase speaks to both Jew and Gentile. For the Messianic Jew, the affirmation, Jesus the Messiah, that is the Christ, was the very center of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. For the Gentile, Jesus was the Lord, that is the kurios. But kurios was a major title for Caesar. Clearly, if Caesar was kurios, if Jesus was kurios, then Caesar was not. Thus, the full phrase, our Lord, Jesus Christ, appears five times in the first 10 verses of 1 Corinthians and is prominent in the opening verses of 1 Peter and elsewhere. Jesus is our kurios, not Caesar. He is also the Messiah of God. We do not wait for another. He is our Lord, Jesus Christ. But if these lofty titles are valid, then the presentation of Jesus in the Gospels must be seen as an authentic witness to his person and ministry. If, on the other hand, the Jesus of the Gospels is a fabrication dreamed up, shaped, and packaged by various forces late in the first century, then he is no more than a quaint mythological figure out of the distant past. We may admire him, as we do Friar Lawrence in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, or Mrs. Hughes in Downton Abbey. 
but not more. What then can be said? The question of why and how the scriptures are a bright light for Christians is a, is a huge topic that has been a major focus in the life of the church for centuries. My purpose this evening is to is briefly set out a few signposts on a continuing journey toward the understanding of how the first century, the 21st century, the scripture continue, can continue to give healing for our journey and guiding light to our path, and how we can maintain confidence in the historical authenticity of the representation of Jesus in the four Gospels. Five aspects of this topic deserve reflection. First is the Reformation focus on sola scriptura, scripture alone. For our brothers and sisters in the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic traditions, the faith of the church rests on two pillars, scripture and tradition. This latter view of Christian foundation has great strength because if in any particular age scripture is left in the past or marginalized by contemporary voices, or interpreted in a way that undermines its integrity, the tradition of the church remains a firm foundation on which the church can stand unshaken. Or if newly established traditions veer off into unhealthy paths, scripture has the inherent ability to call the church back to the great tradition that the church has always affirmed. Furthermore, tradition, Prob properly understood, rests on scripture. Thus, while standing on that foundation stone, if in any age scripture, scripture is shelved or become archaic or judged to be no longer relevant, then the very foundation of tradition itself crumbles and the church is in grave danger of gradually melting away like a snowman on a hot day. This means that the topic of the authority of scripture and the authenticity of its presentation of Jesus are particularly crucial, crucial for the entire church in every age. Second, second has to do with scripture and our traditional view of scripture. Under the umbrella of affirming the authority of scripture, it is easy to unconsciously stand on our traditional interpretation of scripture rather than the scripture itself. The, scripture, the question then becomes, does scripture trump our less than perfect reading of it? That is, does our traditional understanding of scripture control what we allow ourselves to see in scripture? For example, for a very long time in the, the, in the church, many have argued that the Bible is against women in leadership. But in the New Testament, women appear in every form of leadership that exists in the church at that time. This includes apostles. In Romans 16, Paul mentions Junia, a woman whom he calls an apostle and describes as outstanding among the apostles. Furthermore, all the evidence from ancient times affirms that Junia was, without exception, the name of a woman, a view endorsed by the King James Version and by the New English Standard Version. Finally, Junia in Romans 16 is most likely Joanna, whom we already know from Luke 8 and from the resurrection narratives. But our traditional reading of scripture tells us that there were no female apostles. Let's imagine that you study this matter and are convinced that this is the case. What are we going to follow? Will we follow scripture or are we satisfied with our traditional reading of it? I think we must keep our understanding of scripture tentatively final. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, 
it's got to be final because I have to obey today and I can't wait until I've read another article and then decide whether I'm going to obey. In that sense, it has to be final. But it must be tentatively final because tomorrow I will certainly probably find out that, hey, you didn't quite get it quite right, Bailey. You saw it this way, but actually you should see it this way. It's really embarrassing when you publish things and then you find they aren't right. <laughs> We must keep our understanding of scripture tentatively final. Or many have said the New Testament endorses slavery. But in Corinthians 7, Paul tells his readers, do not become slaves of men. He also tells slaves to gain their freedom if they can. Yes, he does tell those who are caught in slavery to obey their masters. The unspoken background of that admonition is that if they fail to do so, they will get killed. Paul is speaking pastorally to Christians, some of whom are trapped in slavery. This is like telling prisoners unjustly incarcerated under a military dictatorship, it is in your best interest to obey the rules of the prison. The assumption is, if you don't obey those rules, the guards are going to kill you. Conclusion, Paul does not endorse slavery. He says, if you're caught in it, get out. And if you're out, don't get in. Once again, in any age, does our traditional understanding of the text control the text itself? Surely, scripture must always be free to correct our understanding of it. This is because we are sinners and our understanding of scripture is always flawed. My Roman Catholic friends tell me that the Second Vatican Council argued powerfully for tradition that is in harmony with scripture. Such a view is surely attractive to all of us. Third, third is the question of the authority of the church and the authority of scripture. For decades, while teaching in the Middle East, I was engaged with Eastern Orthodox scholars who argued that the church selected the books to be included in the Bible, therefore the church created the Bible, and thus the church is preeminent over the Bible. But such an understanding of the formation of the canon does not confirm to what the scripture itself affirms, implies. During the long Lebanese civil war that began in 1975, warring factions often set up roadblocks on highways and checked all passing cars. At such checkpoints, scruffy armed men would stop vehicles and demand to see everybody's identification papers. Having lived through a decade of that war, on such occasions as I displayed my identity card to the man poking his automatic rifle in my face, I did not create the power that he exercised over me. Rather, I surrendered that power as I instinctively recognized it, that power in him and his gun. The man with the gun had that power before I drove up. I did not give it to him. In the early centuries, as the church slowly agreed on the books to be included in the Bible, it did not thereby magically instill spiritual power in those books. Instead, it surrendered to the power it discovered in those unique documents. That was a critical factor in why it took over 300 years to come to one mind concerning which books to be included in the New Testament. Church leaders gradually threw out the documents that did not, in and of themselves, demonstrate such power in the life of the church. It was not like the Supreme Court examining some proposed law. In the case of the court, approving the law gives the power to the legislation in question. But when it is not passed, that law has no power. The court gives power or withholds power. But this mentality does not apply to the formation of the canon. 
The early church endorsed the books that in and of themselves brought the blessing of God in Christ on their readers. To put it another way, the church was not first, the incarnation was. As Jesus began his ministry, he called Peter, Andrew, James, and John with the words, follow me. Those first four disciples obeyed and the church was born. The reality of what Jesus said and did came first, and the disciples' response to him was second. First, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That breaking into history was followed by, we beheld his glory. We did not formulate glory and then like a bright light, shine it on Jesus. The word was given and the church was a response to that word. The gospels are a record of a gift that resulted in the birth of the church. Four, this brings us to the fourth aspect of our subject, which is the doctrine of inspiration. For some decades, decades now, this doctrine has been ignored by many and held as crucial by others. Rational categories have engaged the energies of many scholars. One can read about plenary inspiration, verbal inspiration, infallible writings. The phrase infallible surely means at least it does not fail us. We have in scripture what God wants us to have, and the text taken as a whole does not fail us. However, these rational categories sidestep important parts of the larger story. The problem lies with the definition of historical truth that lie behind the various understandings of the composition of scripture. In the Western world, historical truth expects and presumes precision in reporting. By contrast, the traditional Middle Eastern reporter is expected to interpret what he or she is describing. The interpretation of the events reported are woven into the presentation of those events. This inevitably, inevitably creates various versions of a single event. At the same time, this Middle Eastern understanding of history should be remembered and recorded is out, how history should be remembered and recorded is not unknown to us in the West. I am a Civil War buff. In his three-volume history of the war, Shel Shelby Foote, a Southern historian, gives a long and utterly fascinating account of the crucial Battle of Gettysburg. In regard to the famous Southern general, Robert E. Lee, the reader can overhear Foote saying again and again, poor General Lee, again and again he almost won the battle, but in the end he lost it. Foote names his chapter on the Battle of Gettysburg, the stars in their courses fought against Sisera. <laughs> Judges 5. On the other hand, in a more recent book, Alan Gulzo, a northerner, argues that Lee made some disastrous mistakes and consequently he lost the battle. Both of these authors present true accounts. The reader is not expected to choose one of them as a winner against the other. In like manner, the four Gospels enrich our understanding of the life and ministry of Jesus, and any attempt at forcing them into a single account, like the Diatessaron, is a misunderstanding of their nature. What matters is that the accounts are authentic records of what Jesus said and did that come to us through different witnesses to those events. Those witnesses enrich what they record. So what can we learn from all of this? Going back to the very beginning, 
For us as Christians, the Hebrew scriptures provide a witness to the truth of God and are a foundation for the Greek scriptures where we learn about Jesus and the impact he had on his early followers. At the same time, Jesus went beyond the Hebrew scriptures. Jesus himself said, it was said to you of old, but I say unto you. In short, Jesus affirmed the right to sift the Hebrew scriptures and to be the authoritative interpreter of them. Texts like the massacre of the people of Ai described in Joshua 8, 8 are set aside by Jesus who commands love for all, including the enemy. With Jesus, there is no longer any place for the bashing of Babylonian children against the rocks, Psalm 137. Thus, as we move from the Hebrew to the Greek scriptures, the Hebrew foundation is honored, preserved, endorsed, or superseded. At the same time, identity-forming theology and ethics must pass through the sieve of the person of Jesus and his teachings and the teachings of his earliest followers, the apostles. This brings us to the fifth aspect of our topic. We must ask about the authenticity of the four Gospels as witnesses to Jesus. To do this, we must reflect on how the accounts of Jesus were composed and compiled because such questions relate profoundly to why they are a source of light for all who pledge themselves to follow him. If the Jesus of the Gospels is a late first century fictional fabrication, he can be left in the first century as an archaic remnant from the past. If that were the case, those Gospels would have no more authority over us than the legends of Beowulf for the Germans, the myths of King Arthur for the British, and the folk tales of Paul Bunyan for the Americans. But if the Gospels are records of and responses to the person of Jesus, then all who go by the name of Christian are challenged to take them seriously and to see them as authoritative. How can the question of authenticity be decided? It is not my intent to reopen the long and ponderous debate over the authorship and dating of the final editions of the Gospels. Rather, we would ask briefly, where do the stories in the Gospels come from? What is the origin of the Jesus tradition? Four factors are crucial. First, in Caesarea Philippi, Peter confessed Jesus as the Messiah. As we know, Jesus then told the disciples about his coming arrest, trial, death, and resurrection in Jerusalem. Peter objected and was rebuked. But it is important to note what Peter did not say. He did not suggest that they, uh, that they proceed to nearby Damascus, take the time necessary, record the teachings of Jesus in Aramaic, and perhaps seek help to translate them into Greek. In addition, they could arrange for copies to be made, one for each of the apostles. They then would be prepared to defend their movement if challenged in Jerusalem. This did not happen. Rather, they proceeded to Jerusalem where Jesus was indeed arrested and then challenged before the high priest regarding his teachings. He did not reply, I repeat, he did not reply. I knew you might ask. Actually, we have all the important material recorded in writing. Here is a copy, Rabboni, for your high priestly library. I am ready to defend and explain anything in this scroll. Perhaps you would like to look it over, and then we can discuss it at your convenience. There have always been voices in the church that seem to long for such a document. This kind of a record could then have become some form of a Christian Koran. Yeah. 
But that is not what happened. Rather, Jesus said, ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. Towards the end of his ministry, Jesus could have easily produced a document. He didn't. He deliberately chose to have the witness to his person and teachings passed on by those who heard him and believed him as the Messiah of God. Jesus wanted his message to reach the next generation as accounts that were mixed with insider interpretation. Indeed, all of us instinctively know that meaning is distilled out of any significant historical event through authoritative insider interpretation. Allow me to repeat that sentence. All of us instinctively know that meaning is distilled out of any significant historical event through authoritative insider interpretation. The Gospels are not exceptions to this reality. Kenneth Craig, the late English scholar and bishop, reflects on this convergence of event and interpretation. He notes that the Gospels are not like the myths of King Arthur, and he writes, Plainly, the attitude that we should compare the Gospels to King Arthur is not the New Testament. In the New Testament, there is interpretation. There is possession by love and wonder. But there is also history in the simple sense of events that happened, deeds that were done, suffering that was born, a death that was died, and a rising that happened. The Gospels as documents are certainly interpretive, but they interpret and present what they clearly believe to be events and facts. Here is where we face a problem, he continues. For so much in current Western scientific mentality has been tempted to deny the status of fact and thereby of truth to anything not demonstrable in test tubes or provable by verification. This instinctive reductionism of many contemporary philosophers sadly prevents them from reckoning with the historical meaning of faith and the deep interrelationship of event and mystery. Let us take help from a parable. November 22, 1963, Texas, the USA. Supposing I say a man with a rifle from a warehouse window shot and killed another man in a passing car. Every word here is true, assuming we assume the, Vera, the Warren Commission, but how bleak and meager the facts are so sparse as to be almost no facts at all. The event is not told. But suppose I go further and say, the President of the United States was assassinated. This is more deeply factual because it is more fully related. The victim is identified, the killing is told as political, the perspective is truer. But we are still a long way away from the meaning of the tragedy. Let us attempt a further statement. Men and women all over the world felt that they had looked into the abyss of evil and they wept in the streets. I know I was one of them. That third statement tugs at the heart. It is true with a different sort of truth. It presupposes what the others state, but goes beyond them into dimensions that begin to satisfy the fearful nature of the event that took place. 
without something like that third story, the event would remain concealed in a part-told obscurity so remote as to be in measure false. If all you have to say about the murder of John Kennedy, this is me, not Craig now, all you have to say is a man in a warehouse window shot another man in a passing car. You are not telling the truth. Let us now set the Gospels and the whole New Testament in the light of this parable. Clearly they are of the third kind of statement, deeply involving heart and mind in a confession of experienced meaning, meaning tied intimately to history and to event. That is the way it is with Jesus, not neutrality, bare record, empty chronology, but living participation and heart involvement. For Jesus' story, like all significant history, cannot be told without belonging with the telling in mind and soul. Yet such belonging as it occurs within the pages of the gospel and the epistles is no myth-making, no fantasy, no dimmed Arthurian legend, for it is rooted in a narrative where events occur and dates belong and places figure. He continues, Christian faith is fact, but not bare fact. It is poetry, but not imagination. Like the arch which grows stronger precisely by dint of the weight you place upon it, so the story of the gospel bears with reassuring strength the devotion of the centuries to Jesus as the Christ. What is music? asked Walt Whitman. But what awakens within you when you listen to the instrument? And Jesus is the music of the reality of God. And faith is what awakens when we hearken. With Craig's reflections in mind, let us return to our topic. Jesus was clearly confident that his story would be enriched by such a process. The apostles were commissioned by Jesus to participate with him in the incarnation. As they formulated his ministry and message in order to reach out beyond the range of his voice. And when they spoke, it would be in Aramaic, not Hebrew. So you don't have to use the sacred language. And if it can go from Arama out of Hebrew into Aramaic, of course, it can go into Greek. And it can go into English. Here I must skip, slip into a brief witness to my personal 60-year uh, journey along the path of trying to better understand the Jesus tradition. I now perceive that that tradition is to be based on two great pillars, like the two front pillars of Solomon's temple. For the first 55 years of my ministry, I was working on what I now perceive to be the first of those two pillars, which is the oral tradition. That pillar sets out three stages, which are Jesus and his audience, three years, a period of oral transmission of the Jesus tradition, roughly 30 years, the period of the composition of the Gospels, about another 30 years. In the West, we do not trust oral tradition. The popular cry is, get it in writing. Thus, with this three-step process, the weak link appears to be the period of oral trans tradition. The cry is, after 30 years of oral transmission, who knows what's left that is really authentic to Jesus. Here is where my personal journey has deeply influenced my conclusions. In our first term of ministry in Egypt in the 50s, uh, 
After two years of intensive Arabic study, Ethel and I were assigned to an Egyptian Protestant effort to teach mostly Christian villagers to read their own language, the Arabic language. Our team was naturally invited to work in villages where there was a high level of illiteracy. Such communities were isolated and had no schools, which meant that the brightest and best were still living in the village. After living and working in two such villages nearby, after some analysis, I discovered three forms of oral tradition functioning in those villages. The first I chose to call formal controlled oral tradition, scriptures, classical poetry, thousands of proverbs, extended liturgies recited by the Orthodox priests all fell into that category. A few years later, I once rode in a banged up taxi in Jerusalem with a very scruffy driver who I discovered had memorized the entire Psalter. I was amazed and noting my amazement, he replied, oh, it's not very long. I just memorized one or two Psalms at a time while I'm waiting for my next customer. It wasn't that hard. He was engaged in formal controlled oral tradition. The text of the Psalms was in his glove compartment and he had memorized it. The book exercised control. Any deviation was naturally understood to be a mistake. After all, there are only 150 Psalms. You can pick them up rather easily, right? <laughs> then there was informal, uncontrolled oral tradition. You know, it's amazing how people use their minds in different ways when they're illiterate. The only way you can remember anything is to memorize it. You develop skills just like the blind are able to read with their fingers. I don't know how on earth they do it. They develop those skills because of their needs. To live in an illiterate, to a totally illiterate, almost totally illiterate community was a huge experience for me. And 90% of the first century was illiterate. Then there was informal, uncontrolled oral tradition, jokes, news of the day, complaints about people you don't like, and in time of armed conflict, atrocities, uh, atrocity stories. All of these were examples of uncontrolled oral tradition. Every culture has various forms of this kind of unreliable information floating around. But between these two, I discovered a third type of oral tradition that I called informal controlled oral tradition. In an illiterate community, you cannot write things down. Thus, the stories that form the identity of the community can only be preserved orally, and they are passed on in public meetings. Thereby, there is an inter inner pressure in the community to pass them on accurately, because if, if any reciter fails to tell it right, he or she is corrected in public and thereby humiliated. There is some freedom to tell the story your own way, and this is allowed, as long as the major structure of the story is preserved. I saw this form of oral tradition functioning in a very remarkable way. Behind the two major Christian villages where we lived and worked, there was what the villagers called the refuge city. I visited it many times. It was a miniature town with a church and a collection of one-room homes all cut out of solid rock in the high cliffs behind the village. In times of persecution, I was told, the village would evacuate into the refuge city in the cliffs. Obviously, the refuge city was constructed before the time of Constantine. Regarding what the, uh, that now empty city, a group of women in the village told me, when the Romans came, we escaped into the refuge city up the cliff, and our men would sneak down at night and bring water to us. The story is 1,700 years old. And these women are telling this story in the first person as something that had happened to them. That's who they were. It did happen to them. And that's why they talked that way. 
They recalled those stories from the third century as events in which they had participated. On one visit to the refuge city, I picked up a few pieces of pottery out of the rubble on the floor of one of the one-room homes. I felt like I was walking on very sacred ground. Oh, to know the personal stories of the people who dug those homes and lived in them when persecution drove them from their, into their refuge city. Furthermore, their stone-built church in the village had a secret chamber that was hidden in the arches that support the roof of the church. In times of persecution, they told me, on Sunday, the congregation would quietly gather in the hidden worship space built into the arches and celebrate the Eucharist. The villagers told us a series of stories like this from those early centuries. Those visits and the conversations took place in 1957. But then, almost 50 years later, in 2005, I was privileged to return to one of those two villages and found them telling stories about me. <laughs> I mean, surely everybody can remember a few stories about villagers, about visitors who passed through a, a mere 50 years ago. What amazed me was the fact that in, in 57-59, I was a young kid just out of seminary. Yet 50 years later, they were reciting stories in public about me. I was not the Messiah of God. I was not the savior of the world. They had not shifted their ultimate loyalties to me, and yet they remembered stories about me. We in the West are the ones who are exposed to unnumbered tens of thousands of words each month and naturally have a hard time sifting them in order to remember the important ones. For them, important events took place in their village perhaps once a decade, and retelling them in community was a deep part of who they were. In short, if the, de if the village of Deir el-Barsha could remember me after 50 years, what about the Messianic Jewish community remembering Jesus after 50 years? This is nothing that should surprise us. This is as normal as eating and drinking. I mean, can't everybody do this? They can't imagine a culture like ours in which the answer is, no, we can't. And then they wonder, what's wrong with us? <laughs> N.T. Wright and James Dunn of Scotland have each endorsed my views on the informal controlled oral tradition. Others have attacked them. So be it. My village friends have given me unshakable confidence in their ability to recite and control oral tradition that is important to who they are. That is one pillar behind the Jesus tradition. As we've mentioned, roughly 90% of the ancient world was illiterate. The eyewitnesses to Jesus could recite what they had heard and seen, and the resulting oral tradition was controlled by the community at large. That informal, controlled oral tradition, I'm confident, continued to function to the end till the end of the first century. Writing up the text did not stop the functioning of the oral tradition. The composition of the written gospels would not have affected them. After all, most of them couldn't read anyway. This also is not totally strange to us. We have already invoked the story of John Kennedy, but today, 50 years after his assassination, you cannot write a book in America about him and freely fabricate whatever you like and fashion out of him a person created mostly by your imagination. As a community, we remember him too well. Fanciful inventions about him are simply not possible. The same was true of Jesus. In passing, it should be noted that this same communication method was used by all the other known rabbis of the early centuries. The great Hillel, one generation before Jesus, 
And Akiba, the prominent rabbi near the end of the first century, did not write anything. They're quoted thousands of times, but they never wrote a thing. Their students were expected to learn and then pass on their sayings to those who came after. Much of the rabbinic reflection that fills the 36 volumes of the Babylonian Talmud were passed on orally for hundreds of years before they were committed to writing. Jesus was a rabbi. The other, the second pillar that supports the Jesus tradition suddenly opened up in the back of my mind about two years ago. I mean, I only worked on this problem 58 years and never saw it, but so finally it appeared. This has to do with the origins of the Greek written sources to the Jesus tradition. This aspect of the reliability of the Jesus tradition began with the just noted challenge Jesus gave to his disciples in front of the high priest. Then came the resurrection. For the disciples, the resurrection surely put the ultimate seal on their sacred commission to pass on their remembered traditions from and about Jesus. The resurrection affirmed that he was still among them. In the light of that resurrection, their responsibility to witness what they had seen and heard could not be put off or ignored. The next building block in this second pillar is the startling appearance of the Hellenists in the life of the Jerusalem church. In Acts 6, we are told of a church made up of two branches. One was called the Hebraists and the other was called the Hellenists. The Hellenists were Greek-speaking Jews who believed in Jesus. In the text, the Hellenists complained that the money the church held in common was not being divided fairly. The apostles nobly responded by giving all the money to the Hellenists and leaving it to them to make the distribution. Our question is, how did these Greek-speaking Jews living in Jerusalem hear about, believe in, and choose to follow Jesus? They were not Greek God-fearers out in the Gentile world who were attracted to Judaism but had not joined it. The Hellenists in Acts 6 were Jews, but their language and culture was Greek, and they all had Greek names. Their commitment to the Church of Jesus Christ was so deep that they turned over all of their financial resources to the newly formed church. Think of that. All their financial resources were thrown into the pot. Such an act signals a profound commitment to that common faith. Our question is, how did these Greek-speaking Hellenists find out about Jesus and the gospel. Clearly, the disciples were missional from the very beginning. They had an outreach to Greek-speaking Jews at this earliest stage in the life of the church. Those Hellenists did not, did not have the advantage of a large pool of Aramaic-speaking members who had followed Jesus from the beginning and who could describe firsthand what they had seen and heard. Jesus' preaching ministry was primarily in Galilee, and he preached in Aramaic. These Hellenists were from Jerusalem and probably would not have been able to understand him easily in any case. But after the resurrection... They became followers. How so? Both the disciples who reached out to these Hellenistic Jews and their own leaders would have inevitably have needed stories about Jesus in Greek. The only way to understand the development of this very early Greek-speaking branch of the church in Jerusalem is to assume an early transcription and translation into Greek of the stories of Jesus. Is this not what Luke affirms in Luke 1? Luke opens his gospel by noting that many have undertaken to compile a narrative. In the second verse, he affirms contact with the eyewitnesses. 
Luke tells us that his goal was to put a selection of this material into an appropriate order so that Theophilus might know the truth concerning it. In short, from the very beginning, there was a specific need to record the, record the individual stories about Jesus in writing and to see that they were translated into Greek for the use of the mission of the church to the Hellenists. We can easily imagine the following. Every week or so, a leader of the Christian Hellenists, we can call him Lambros, approaches Peter and says, Peter, Saturday is approaching. Can't you get another story about Jesus transcribed and translated into Greek so we can use it in worship? Peter answers, sure, Lambros, I'm sure we can manage. We'll do our best. I'll have something for you by Thursday night. Maybe we can go over it on Friday. I'll bring one of our better Greek speakers with me. After a few years, this kind of Aramaic to Greek ministry, it is easy to understand Luke's claim that many have undertaken to write. Clearly, Luke had available to him a disconnected stack of stories about Jesus that were already written down using the finest stylistic of the classic writing prophets. The people who did the work were Jews. They knew what they were doing. They condensed the stories so that they wouldn't have it too long and nobody could afford to have it copied. The success of that early witness to the Hellenists is then on display in Acts 6, where a Greek-speaking congregation of Messianic Jews suddenly appears. To summarize, the apostles had a sacred commission from the lips of Jesus delivered in public before the high priest. That commission to tell his story was energized by the resurrection, and an important part of their response is on display in their successful mission to the Greek-speaking Hellenists. While delayed in Jerusalem with Paul for two years, in the mid-50s, Luke most likely discovered the existence of these accounts. He also interviewed eyewitnesses who represented the early oral tradition about Jesus. He then took the material that he gathered from those two sources, organized it in a meaningful way, and produced a gospel. We need now to return for a moment to the topic of the inspiration of the Bible in the light of these observations. As seen here, the inspiration of scripture was not a series of lightning flashes of divine dictation such as Islam claims for the Quran. It is better understood as the moving of the spirit through a process that in regard to the gospels involved four stages. The first focuses on Jesus and his audience. The second is the powerful oral tradition, along with the early recording and translation of the stories in Greek. Third, perhaps, comes the formation of small collections of those accounts to fit the growing needs of the mission and worship of the church. And finally, there is the compilation, editing, and publishing of the Gospels as we know them. We know that in this process it was inspired by God because of the power of the end result. The gospels that emerged out of that process have changed the lives of uncounted billions across history and in our own day. What then can be very briefly said about Paul? Paul did not start a movement, he joined one. About 25 years after the resurrection, Paul told the Corinthians, what I received, I delivered unto you. He was given a get Christian tradition that he passed on to others. That tradition included many things. We will briefly note two of them. First, Paul writes, I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for, for our sins and arose again on the third day. This affirmation that Jesus saves us through his death and resurrection was already a fixed part of the tradition of the church before Paul wrote to the Corinthians in the year 55 AD. It was not a late first century uh, invention. 
Second, Paul also quoted an early Christian creed when he wrote to the Corinthians, for us there is one God, the Father, for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom we exist. We don't have to wait for John to write John 1 to get the idea of Jesus as the word of God through whom creation comes about. We have it here already in the middle of the century out of the, out of the mouth of Paul. This text affirms that Jesus was the agent of God in our creation. Thus, Jesus was the savior and God's agent in creation. Paul received these aff affirmations. He did not create them. From where, we must ask, did these ideas come? Were they from Jesus himself? Time constraints require that we limit our discussion to one major theme from the one, uh, one uncontested saying of Jesus. In Luke 15, in the early verses, the scribes and Pharisees were upset because Jesus was eating meals with people they judged to be unclean. This man, this, the word man isn't there, receives sinners and eats with them, they complained. Those Pharisees naturally wanted to debate their major disagreements with Jesus. These were food laws, tithing laws, ceremonial purity, Sabbath observance. Jesus replies to this challenge by telling a story about a good shepherd who goes after a lost sheep, carries it home, and has a party. His audience knows this story. It appears first in Psalm 23 and then is reshaped, reshaped and retold by three of the prophets. In all four of these accounts, the good shepherd is God. And in the writing of the prophets, God pledges to one day enter history himself as a good shepherd and save his lost flock. By repeating this story in this setting, Jesus is affirming that in him, God's promise is being fulfilled. He is the divine presence among them. That is why he welcomes sinners and eats with, him, with them. He is the divine good shepherd, and he is rounding up his lost sheep. This understanding of Jesus as the promised divine shape, savior is not a late first century fabrication. Rather, it comes from us in a very Jewish way from the lips of Jesus himself. To conclude, we can with full confidence affirm that the four Gospels are authentic records of what Jesus said and did as internalized and passed on by those who heard and believed his message. The church living under the authority of scripture is not a snowman in grave danger of melting away because of the burning rays of a hot secular sun that is beating down upon it. Rather, it is the flock of God, saved by the divine shepherd, who safely leads his sheep through angry waters to quiet inlets where the sheep can drink and be renewed to go in and out as they live out their lives, continue in their worship, and fulfill their ministries, having received amazing grace, sufficient to overcome many dangers, toils, and snares. May it be so with us today. Amen. Thank you.